Nalaka, Nalaka Sutta. Introductory verses. The Rishi Asita, while passing the day, saw the Tavatisma Devas, joyful and ecstatic. Having honored Indra, clad in clean garments, carrying streamers, they were proclaiming exuberant praise. Having seen the Devas exalted and elated, having shown them respected, he said this to them. For what reason is the group of Devas exuberant to jubilant? Why do you take streamers and swirl them around? Even there was a battle with the Asuras. When the gods were victorious and the Asuras defeated, even then there was no such excitement. What wonder have the good seen that they rejoice? They whistle and sing and play music. They clap their arms and dance around. I ask you, dwellers on Mount Meru speak. Dear sirs, quickly dispel my bafflement. In Lumbini, a village in the Sakyan country, the Bodhisattva, the excellent gem, unequal has been born into a human world for well-being and happiness. Hence we are so delighted and extremely jubilant. He is the best of all beings, the foremost person, the chief bull of men, the best of all creatures. He will turn the wheel in the grove name for the wishes, roaring like a powerful lion, the lord of beasts. Having heard that utterness, he quickly descended, and then approached the residence of Sudodhana. Having sat down there, he said to the Sakyans, Why is the prince? I do wish to see him. Then the Sakyans showed Asita their son, who was radiant with splendor and of perfect color. The prince shone like gold burnished in the mouth of a furnace by highly skilled. Having seen the prince blazing like a crested flame, pure like the moon, lord of stars, moving in the sky, like the beaming autumn sun freed from clouds, already delighted, he gained abundant joy. The gods held up a parasol in the sky, with multiple ribs and thousand circles. Golden handle, chowries moved up and down but none were seen holding the chauris or paroles. The Matitya Rishi named Black Gauri, having seen him like the gold nugget on the red blanket, with the white paroles being held over his head, received him elated and happy. Then having received the Sakyan bull, examining him, the master of marks and hymns was pleased in mind and emitted a cry. He is unsurpassed, the best of bipeds. Then recollecting his old departure, he became dismayed and shed bitter tears. Seeing this, the Sarkin asked the weeping Rishi, Will some misfortune befall the prince? Seeing the Sarkin dismayed, the Rishi said, I don't foresee harm for the prince. There will be no obstacle for him, not the least, so set your mind at ease. This prince will reach the foremost enlightenment one of the supremely purified sight. Compassionate for many people, he will set in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. His spiritual life will become widespread. But the remainder of my life here is not long. My death will occur in the interval. I will not hear the Dhamma of the unequal in fortitude. Hence I am troubled, distressed and dejected. Having brought the Sarkin's abundant joy, the holy man left the place, out of compassion for his own nephew. He enjoyed him in the Dhamma of the one unequal in fortitude. When you hear from another world the Buddha and one who attained enlightenment reveals the foremost Dhamma, having gone to him, asking his doctrine, lead the spiritual life under that blessed one. Instructed by such a one with benevolent mind, whose vision of the future was supremely purified, Nalaka, one with a store of accumulated merit, expecting the conqueror to dwell with guarded faculties. Having heard the word about the conqueror setting in motion the excellent wheel of the Dhamma, having gone, he saw the chief Rishi and was pleased. Since the time for Asita's instruction has arrived, he asked the excellent Muni about supreme Munihood. The Instructions the statement of Azita has been known by me to be true to fact. 
Therefore I ask, O Gautama, one who has gone beyond all phenomena, since I have entered the homeless lives seeking sustenance on arms round, being asked, O Muni, please explain to me Munihood, the ultimate way. I will describe Munihood to you, the Blessed One said. Hard to practice and hard to master. Come, I will tell you about it. Brace yourself and be firm. One should have the same attitude whether one is insulted or venerated in the village. One should guard against anger in the mind. One should keep calm without being elated. Rivals' impressions high and low come forth like flames in a forest. Women try to seduce the Muni. Don't let them seduce you. Refraining from sexual intercourse, having given up sensual pleasures fine and coarse, one should not be hostile and attached to having beings both frail and firm, to living beings both frail and firm. Reflecting, as I am, so they are, as they are, so am I, having taken oneself as a criterion, one should not kill or cause others to kill. Having given up desire and greed for that to which the world wording is attached, one with the vision should practice so that one may cross this inferno. Not filling one's belly moderate in food, one should be of few desires without longing. One is hungerless with respect to desire, desireless one is quenched. Having wandered on arms of all, he should resort to the woods. Staying at the foot of a tree, the Muni should take his seat. That steadfast one intent on jhana should take delight in the woods. He should meditate at the foot of a tree, making himself fully content. Then, with the passing of the night, he should approach the village. He should not welcome invitations and offerings brought from the village. When the Muni has come to the village, he should not behave rashly among families. Having cut off talk, aimed at getting food, he should not utter suggestive words. I have received something that is good. I have received nothing that is fine. In both situations, remaining impartial, he returns to the tree itself. Wandering with bowl in hand, not dumb, though considered dumb, one should not scorn a small offering, no should one despise the giver. High and low is the practice taught by the ascetic. They do not go in two ways to the far shore, yet it is not experienced in a single way. For one who has no diffusion, for Vikru who has cut off the stream, who has abandoned what is to be done and not done, no fever of defilements exists. I will describe Munihut to you, the Blessed One said. One should treat it like the blaze of a razor. Having pressed one's plate with the tongue, exert control over one's belly. One should not be sluggish in mind, nor should one ponder much. Be unpolluted, unattached, with the spiritual life as one's support. One should trade in a solitary siege and the exercise of an ascetic. It is solitude that is called Munihud. If you will delight one, you will light up the ten directions. Having heard the claim of the wise, of the meditators who have renounced sensual pleasures, my followers should develop even more a sense of a moral shame and faith. Understand this by way of rivers and in terms of cleft and ravines. The creek flow on noisily while silent the great rivers flow. What is empty makes a noise. What is full is ever quiet. The fool is like a half full barrel, the wise man like a full lake. When the ascetic speaks much, it is meaningful and beneficial, knowing he teaches the Dhamma, knowing he speaks much. But one who knowing is self-controlled, who knowing does not speak much, that Muni is worthy of Munihood, that Muni has achieved Munihood. <laughs>